Oh, there's a few more bodies. Let's see what happened to our um, our two that we. <coughs> Donna, you know where uh, Rebecca and Sarah. All right. Well, I thought uh, perhaps we could uh, begin by turning up Philippians chapter four. I have a, uh, 10 verses I'd like to read just to get started this evening. But rather than giving a synopsis of what we've looked at uh, thus far, we'll just go ahead and break right into the new topic, give us a little bit more time. So Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 20. We'll go ahead and, and read that. Uh, Paul writes, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, I read this passage uh, not to look at the, the part that has to do with the giving, but rather how Paul was looking at the giving, uh, and not so much um, how the Lord was going to bless the Philippians for their giving, but uh, how he responded to the fact that the Philippians actually provided uh, this gift for him. Uh, he first of all commends them for, um, uh, for the fact that they're concerned for him, has uh, revived. And he mentions that they were concerned before, but apparently lacked the opportunity to be able to help him. But now they had the opportunity and they acted on it. But now look at uh, Paul's reaction, though, in this text. He said that even if they hadn't been able to, to give to him, to, to help him in any way, that he would have been content anyway because he had learned how to be so in every circumstance. And notice he says that he knows how to get along in humble means or prosperity, the secret of being filled or going hungry, of having abundance or suffering need. And the question I want to ask this evening is, how was it that he was able to do this? What, uh, what is his secret? of being content, because I think this is perhaps, uh, well, not only a very important ministry of the Holy Spirit, but I think one of the most important lessons that we have to learn as Christians, perhaps one of the most important lessons we can ever learn, and that is the secret of being content. <clears throat> because you know, just about all unrest that takes place in the world today, uh, virtually every evil act comes from uh, some kind of discontentment and you know that also plagues us as believers. So how is it we can be content? Paul said that he could do all things through the one who strengthened him, that he had a secret source of help that transcended apparently every circumstance that he found himself in. Now, if I were to ask you uh, where that help comes from, what would be the most obvious answer? Well, the Holy Spirit would be obvious because that's what already he said. But uh, if, if you were just reading the text, uh, what would you think his answer would be? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yes, through Jesus Christ. 
And I believe that the one or the thing that, that our Lord Jesus Christ does that is able to give this contentment is again the ministry of his Holy Spirit. I think the Spirit is the secret to being content. And why, why do you suppose is that? Uh, why, why do you, what do you think the Spirit of God actually does? Yes, sir? Okay. It, it does, certainly it does. Um, uh, we'll, we'll look into that a little bit more uh, deeply, but I think the idea is the Spirit of God um, uh, helping us to sense the love of God and the love of Christ for us can certainly give to us uh, a certain kind of contentment and peace and joy. Okay, but, but peace and joy, I think, is, is what I'm wanting to focus on. The Spirit of God gives to us joy. He gives us peace. And I think the fruit of those things would be contentment. Because what is discontentment, after all, except the absence of certain things and the presence of, we might say, of things that are negative, we don't sense that peace. We don't perhaps uh, uh, sense joy. But uh, rather, there is a, um, uh, well, a discontentment for um, uh, the circumstances that we find ourselves uh, in. Uh, what is it, when we say we're discontent or we don't, we don't have contentment, what is it that um, we're actually experiencing within us? What is it that causes a lack of contentment? Okay, emptiness, emptiness for? Okay, well, ultimately that would be true, wouldn't it? Um, but oftentimes people don't identify it in that way. They usually think it's something else that's missing, right? Uh, what else? What else would there be? What's that? Okay, yes, okay. When you covet. All right. It, it's usually you, you see something that, that you want, something you don't yet have, and you develop a strong desire for it, and it drives you to seek after that particular thing. Sometimes we don't even know what it is. We just know we're not happy, and we know there's something missing, and that makes us discontent, and so we won't really feel settled until we actually have that thing that we know we want or that thing that we don't know that we want um, until we actually have that. What are some of those things that, that we might um, desire that would make us not content? Financial security, okay. That can be one thing, funds to live on, and sometimes people have funds to live on and still aren't content, right? But they, they yes, they want more, more of the same. Uh, what else can cause uh, discontentment? Okay, and uh, with, with few exceptions, most people aren't content with the way they look and they would like those kinds of things to change, so discontent over the way they look, okay? Health, that's right. Health can certainly do that. Uh, anything else? Okay. Right, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, uh, boastful pride of life, um, fame and fortune, riches and so forth, good looks, as has already been mentioned, uh, I suppose the first one we talked about was, was wealth or possessions, okay? Things that we see. What about circumstances? Are we ever discontent over circumstances that we're, we're in, right? Now, let's, let's think about this for a minute. Okay, we think about all the things that could possibly make us discontent. And, um, well, maybe I should ask for a show of hands. I won't do that. But how many of you are actually content? Is there anything that you're thinking of that you don't have, that you desire, that is making you Discontent, does it fall into one of these categories? Well, the question I'd like to ask is, if those particular wants and desires uh, were actually met, circumstances changed for the better, or uh, I got those riches that I wanted, or I got those good looks, or whatever it is, 
that I happen to be discontent over, do you think that that would make you content? Okay, uh, I, think that's, I think that's exactly right. The answer is no, but yes, momentary satisfaction because there's that, uh, that feeling that I finally got what I was after, but the th thing is that, that it wears off really quick, doesn't it? I was just thinking about some of these things. Um, uh, for instance, if I had more possessions, you know, would those things make me happy? Uh, I, I <laughs> When you know you, you experience certain things in life, you, you gain examples as you go through life. And there was a, a friend that I used to have that was a great example of this because at a very early age, he was able to get things that some people working their whole lives would not be able to have, and yet they didn't make him happy. Uh, back when I was, uh, I think probably in my either late teens or early 20s, he, he bought a Porsche Turbo Carrera which at the time I think was a $60,000 car, which would be a lot of money today. I mean, it was a lot of money back then. I mean, who can afford $60,000 today? But he got one back then. He owned it for a week, and he got tired of it and sold it. A car that most of us will never, ever see or drive, you know. And then he also uh, he, he had this, this palatial house built. It was uh, a custom house that had gold-plated faucets and servants' quarters. I mean all these different things. And before the house was even completed, he had gotten tired of it. I think virtually put it on the market as soon as it was done, uh, losing money each step of the way, of course, because you just can't buy things like this and turn them around. But the fact is that these things didn't satisfy. They did not satisfy him. So if you had more of these kinds of things, I mean, would they, would they make you happy? Would they make you content? More money, more property? perhaps more relationships. You know, I think about the people in the world who have all these kinds of things. You know, the people that, that are rich, you know, the people perhaps that are famous, uh, uh, movie stars, you know. Are they really happy? You know, do their lives show that, um, you know, these things are fulfilling? They're actually uh, content with these things. I mean, what do you see when you look at the rich and famous? I don't know if you've ever looked into the biographies of some of these people, what do you usually see? Drugs, alcohol, divorce, a long string of spouses, that's right. Uh, usually, it seems like a lot of them have children that die, you know, early, because they've probably been raised with, as it were, the silver spoon. Don't appreciate things. And you know what, the ones that really seem to uh, be crashing and burning are the ones that gain a lot of fame very early on in their lives. It's almost like they've, they've gone way beyond uh, what, what anybody should ever have, and they don't know how to handle it when they're young. And if they lose any of that popularity, it just devastates them. So again, do these kinds of things actually make a person content? And then the idea of, um, you know, if everything were going your way, okay, I don't like my circumstances, I wish they would change, and yet, if I'm in a different set of circumstances, are those circumstances going to um, make me happy? Are they going to make me content? Or am I going to have the same problem that I had with the first set of circumstances? Because I think no matter what they are, we always look at the other side of the fence. Grass is always greener on the other side. It doesn't matter where you are. It's always better somewhere else. Well, why is it that these things don't bring contentment? Why do they only satisfy for a, you know, a short period of time and after that they don't bring any more? Kathy, did you? Well, okay, Sin, <laughs> that's right. Uh, if we looked at things the way we should look at them um, and look at what we really deserve, I mean, what, what do we really deserve? We deserve hell. And the fact that we're not in hell, uh, burning right now for our sins means that we should be uh, thankful and content that we're here especially that we have such a glorious future in front of us. But, okay, that's one good reason. What's another reason why these things can't satisfy for very long? Okay, I think they're only temporary. That's right, they, they certainly are, but... 
More what? That's certainly true too. What if, um, what if, taking your first point, what if we were able to extend our lives indefinitely in this world so that whatever we had we could keep forever? Would we lose interest in those things anyway? What's that? Well, let, let's, say that, let's say that they would survive too. <laughs> would we get tired of those things if we could have those things or whatever we wanted forever? Would we get tired of those things? Why would we get tired of them? Okay, they're not the things that can bring contentment, but why, why is that? Can you think of why that is? All right, okay. If, let me just ask you this question. If you had, um, let's say, I don't know, uh, one, one thing that you could possess for a thousand years, and maybe it's entertaining at first, what happens after a while? What, what, what gets, gets old, you get, you get tired of it. And why do you get tired of it? It's because it's just, it's limited, right? It can only do so much, and you get tired of what it can do. Uh, it, we, we might say, uh, this is kind of, was, and, and this, I didn't know if anybody would get this or not, but the idea is it's, it's limited, it's finite, there's only so much joy and pleasure it can give, and then it wears out, then you get tired of it, okay? We reach the end of the pleasure that it's able to bring, and we want something different. So now, if we're going to find contentment, where are we actually going to find contentment, or what are we going to find it in, if we can't find it in the things of this world that are all limited? Somebody who is infinite, that's right, infinite and eternal. That's right. I uh, wanted to draw on just a quote that um, St. Augustine, if we can use, well, we should probably use the term saint. We're all saints. So St. Saint, saint Dick, St. Saint, and saint Kathy, and so forth. But we're, all, we're all saints as far as the Lord is concerned, but Augustine wrote in his uh, Confessions. This was back in the year around 397 A.D. He says, You have made us for yourself, O Lord and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Now, Augustine recognized that uh, the things of the world are not going to bring ultimate satisfaction. I think we think that they will until we possess them. But as my friend found out, who had things that all never have, and of course Solomon, you see, we don't want to learn from other people, do we? We want to learn for ourselves, but we really need to listen to what Solomon had to say, because Solomon was extremely rich, and he had he had everything. Okay? He had, uh, well, he, in his days, I guess, uh, silver was like common, like the stones in the street. And there was lots and lots of gold in those days. And he had plenty of gold. He had plenty of servants. He sought pleasure in all different areas. By the way, relationally, as far as relationships, how many relationships did Solomon have? What's that? Hundreds. Hundreds? Okay. He had 300 wives, and, and those concubines, we have to remember, they weren't just sort of, I mean, they were, they were it was a, a marriage of sorts, so he had virtually a thousand wives, a thousand wives. And apparently, one wasn't enough, two, three, 10, 20, 100, 200, 300. Of course, he made several uh, political marriages. That's one of the reasons why he had uh, so many wives, but I don't think the concubines came from that source. The Lord told him not to do that, and yet, even all those relationships did not bring him contentment, again, because only one can bring you contentment because only one is infinite. God is the only one ultimately who can satisfy you because he's not only infinite, but regardless of, of how, you know, let's say the unbeliever may view him, the believer sees him as he really is. And what does the believer see when he looks at God? Okay, and those things are, what's that? 
eternity, okay? What do all those things make God to the Christian? Well, they make him, he, he's satisfying, and he's satisfying because he is desirable, right? He is infinitely beautiful. So think about one who is infinitely beautiful, infinitely satisfying, who is infinite in every way. Uh, he's the only one who really can give contentment. And the reason is because he can give limitless joy and peace, which is ultimately, I think, what brings contentment. Now, Edwards, um, Edwards pointed this out. Um, I thought this was a very interesting quote that even the most satisfying of earthly relationships, what would that be, perhaps? Uh, what's the most satisfying of earthly relationships that a person can have? Okay, ma marriage, okay. Friendships are good. Marriage is, is a very, very close friendship. Edwards points out that even marriage has its limits, but relationship with God does not. This is what he writes in one of his miscellaneous. He says this. By the way, Edwards was married, so he uh, knows from experience. How soon do earthly lovers come to an end of their discoveries of each other's beauty? How soon do they see all that is to be seen? Are they united as near as it is possible and have communion as intimate as possible? How soon do they come to the most endearing expressions of love that it is possible to come to so that no new ways can be invented, given, or received? And how happy is that love in which there is an eternal progress in all these things, wherein new beauties are continually discovered and more and more loveliness, and in which we shall forever increase in beauty ourselves, when we shall be made capable of finding out and giving and shall receive more and more endearing expressions of love forever, our union will become more close and communion more intimate. So Edwards is saying that though our relationships on earth as far as the, uh, you know, let's say the new discoveries as far as love, because it, it does reach, as it were, a climax, uh, that is limited, but our relationship with the Lord is not. It seems to indicate that not only do we see more and more beauty in God, since we can't really see it all at one time. We're just we're finite creatures. We can't take in the infinite. We'll never be able fully to comprehend God. By the way, there was a historic name for that, uh, that view of God that we'll get to see when we enter into heaven, the beatific vision. That's right. And that's what all the saints were desirous to see, is to see God in all of his glory as he displays himself in heaven. Now, Edwards indicates that that view that we have of God is going to be increasing throughout eternity so that we will never come to an end of new discoveries of his beauty. And he says at the same time, we are going to increase in beauty ourselves, perhaps as we become, I don't know, increasingly knowledgeable about the Lord, or perhaps there's a glory that uh, we'll be gaining as we go throughout eternity. I'm not sure, but that relationship continues to grow and never stops growing. So this is satisfaction. You see, this brings ultimate contentment. Now here's the next question. Uh, granted, this is true. Do we have to wait till we get to heaven before we can be content? Okay, now in the ultimate sense, we might say that's true, but is there any of this joy, any of this contentment to be had while we're in this world. Okay. Now here's where we get to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, I think. Now we have seen that the Spirit of God communicates to us His nature uh, in regeneration. I mean, what, what is it that the Spirit of God does in order to enable us to see the beauty that is in God? What does He do that enables us to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? What's the work? Okay, he gives us the strength to see what? To 
Okay, to, to fight against sin, that's true. He gives us the strength to do that. And what is the strength that he gives us? What's that? Love, ah, love, yes. The love of God, the love of holiness. So the Spirit of God in the act of regeneration makes us love God and makes us love the things of the Lord so that we receive his Son. As his Son is offered to us in the gospel because we can't live without him, because we love him, we desire him, because he's beautiful, and so forth. And that's what saves us. We put our trust in him. But the Spirit of God is, is in Scripture also called something else as far as his relationship to heaven and our eternal reward. Does anybody think of the, of the term that he has used in that, in that regard? He's, he is um, like the down payment, right. He is like the down payment of heaven. He is like the pledge of our, in, of our heavenly inheritance. If we look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, we read this. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the glory of his grace. Now, in heaven, um, when, when we're finally, uh, let's say, raised from, well, even when we're not raised from the dead, let's say when we die and we go to heaven, what's the difference let's say, in, in heaven with regard to our souls versus our souls here on earth? What's the difference between what they're like up there and what they're like down here? Okay, free from sin, that's one thing. And uh, why, I guess this wouldn't really be the reason why, but um, what is our relationship to the Spirit of God going to be up there that it isn't uh, yet down here? Okay, well, that, that's true. We live by faith here. We live by sight there. And as far as our relationship with the Spirit of God, do we? Okay. Okay, and why is that? And we will be because we will be filled with the Spirit in a way that we are not filled with the Spirit now. We do have a down payment of heaven here. We have... The Spirit of God who is the pledge or the down payment, but there we will be, uh, as it were, swallowed up by the Spirit of God, which, you know, remember that, that the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry was anointed with the Spirit above measure. Edwards had some interesting views on what that actually meant, but um, I think his view was that that is what constituted um, the person who was in the, the, the man Christ Jesus with the divine Logos or the Son of God but it also meant that he was sanctified, perfectly sanctified. Okay? Now, in heaven, we'll be filled with the Spirit also in a way that we're not filled with the Spirit here, and we will be perfectly sanctified there. The same thing will be true when our bodies are raised and they're transformed into the glorious image of Jesus Christ. They will be filled with the Spirit of God so that we will, uh, we're, we're said to be raised uh, spiritual. And spiritual has to do with our relationship with the Spirit of God. Well, the point is, I mean, that, that perfection awaits heaven, but right now we have a foretaste of the Spirit of God or, or a foretaste of heaven in, in the Spirit. And the question is, what, what is that foretaste of heaven? What is, I mean, is it just the possession of the Spirit of God, or how else do we taste ahead of time what's going on in heaven? Except... The Spirit of God is working those same things in us right now, only imperfectly. So we're getting a foretaste of joy. We're getting a foretaste of peace. We're getting a foretaste of contentment, those things that actually make us content now, which we'll have fully up there. And really, that's the only thing that can fully satisfy us. Again, Paul writes in, in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
So the, what does the Spirit actually work within us? Well, he works these particular fruits, uh, again, all of which spring from love, but joy and peace which bring contentment. Are you familiar with that passage of Scripture where uh, Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you? What do you think he means by that? You know, the kingdom doesn't come with signs, as it were, but the kingdom of God is within you. What do you think he was referring to there? Okay, his, his spirit giving to us that foretaste of heaven. I think that that's likely what Jesus is referring to. Paul writes in Romans 14, verse 17, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's what the kingdom of heaven is all about. You know, the funny thing is you listen to these health and wealth gurus. I listening to one of them one time talking about how every time you give to his ministry, you're sending materials up to heaven to build your mansion. And so they think of, of things in, you know, in the kingdom of heaven in heaven as being material like it is on earth. And they, want, they think somehow a mansion is going to be of some value to you in heaven, when as a matter of fact, it, it really isn't because of the joys that are in heaven. The blessings are much better than that. The kingdom of heaven isn't eating and drinking. It's not living in rich quarters or having mansions, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Again, when Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you, that is what he meant, is that that foretaste of heaven is present in us by the Holy Spirit. Now, why do you think that the disciples were able to endure what they were able to endure? I mean, you know, when they went out preaching the gospel, people didn't often receive it well. They were persecuted by the Jews sometimes by Gentiles, but most often by the Jews. Um, and yet we read in Acts 13, verse 52, and the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. You see, as Paul was mentioning earlier in our text, if you have the Spirit of God, you have a source of contentment that transcends all these things that people think that they need to have in order to be happy in order to be content. I think this is one of the reasons why uh, Paul tells the, uh, the Ephesians that they are to be filled with the Spirit of God. It's because that if you are filled with the Spirit, then you will also at the same time be content and you won't go looking into the things of the world or going after the things of the world to try to satisfy you because they're not going to satisfy. You know, whenever we feel discontent, where do we often look in order to satisfy that, that lack of contentment in, in our hearts? Where do we often look? I mean, what do we try to fill it with? with what's that? Yeah, with, with the world. We look at the things of the world and we think, if I can just have more of this or more of that, more of this entertainment, more fun, more money, more whatever it is, that that's going to satisfy the hunger of my heart. But um, is it going to satisfy you? That's right. That's right. You know, sometimes we, um, we even try to put the burden of our joy and our contentment, we try to, to put that onto others and say, I'm not happy, it's because of you, or it's because of you. We try to put that on people or we put it on things, or we put it on our circumstances, and we say, that's why I'm not happy, that's why I'm not content. But ultimately, why are we not happy? And why are we not content if we aren't content? It's because we haven't found it where we need to look for it, right? We haven't found it in the Lord. If we place the burden of our contentment on other people, other things, or on circumstances, what's, what's ultimately going to happen? Yes, they will disappoint us and they will let us down. Where do we need to place the burden of our contentment then? Uh, upon, on, on what do we place it? Or on whom? <laughs> That's right. 
Because God has actually promised that he's going to meet that need through the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to drink from that divine and heavenly fountain instead of the earthly fountain. You know, um, as Jesus said something to this effect when he was speaking to the woman at the well of Samaria, and we can probably look at it as sort of a, a way to summarize, at least by way of analogy, um, this whole thing. She offered him the water of the world, you know. And Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Now, doesn't that summarize what we're looking at? Uh, the things of this world are like water which can't satisfy, are things which we're going to get tired of. If we drink of this fountain, we're going to thirst again. But if we drink of the water that Jesus gives, and by the way, what, what is the water that Jesus gives? The Spirit of God. Then you will never thirst. At least you'll never thirst for the things of this world because you will be satisfied. There is a hungering and a thirsting which the Spirit of God actually creates within us for the Lord so that we go to Him and we find our satisfaction there. That's really the only good hungering and thirsting. But the only thing that satisfies ultimately, of course, is the Lord. And so again, the, the ministry of the Spirit of God, what, what does He do in, in our lives? What is His work? Well, one of the things that He does is He satisfies our souls with contentment. He gives us peace. He gives us joy. He gives us satisfaction. And really, if, if you're content, then uh, actually that, that makes a huge difference in the way that you live. It also makes a huge difference in the way that you relate to others because, again, you don't place the burden of your happiness on someone else, but instead you're in a place where you can help somebody else find happiness by leading them to the Lord. But if you're always a needy person and your needs aren't met, you're always going to be looking for somebody to meet your needs. Well, the Lord is the only one you can. He can meet them. He can bring satisfaction. And when he does, then in the strength of that contentment, you can reach out to others. So again, this is a very important ministry of the Spirit of God. Uh, he is the only one who is the infinite love of God. and He's the only one who can fully satisfy our souls. And so again, we need to remember, as Augustine said, Lord, you've made us for yourselves and our, you know, we're, our souls are restless until they find their rest in you. That's where we need to find our rest, our contentment is in the Lord. And that's why one of the reasons why the Lord gives us his spirit. Do you have any uh, questions or comments? Okay. And why, uh, why would we have to be commanded to, to do that, even as believers? Right? We, we still have a desire for the things of the world, and we feel discontent. We still look to the world to meet those needs. But Paul says, set your affections on heaven, because that's the only place, the only way that you're you know, your heart, your soul is going to be satisfied. The things of the world will not satisfy, but only the Lord will. That, which is, again, getting back to why Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content in whatever circumstances I'm, I'm in. I know how to get along with abundance. Actually, we think, well, that'd be kind of easy to do, but yet we see how abundance can destroy people. But he's also learned how to get along in humble circumstances and want because he really at all times has everything that he needs. No one can take the Lord from him. So he always has infinite love dwelling in his soul and that makes him content. You know, we, we really ought to, uh, as we think about times when we feel discontent, is look to the Lord and spend some time with him and see if that doesn't satisfy the desire of the soul instead of trying to just scoop in things you know that we usually try to satisfy our hunger with 
uh, things of the world, entertainment, fun, recreation, food, you know, whatever it may be, we should look to the Lord and find our contentment and happiness in Him because He is far more satisfying. I'm not saying, of course, we should cut off all food. We certainly need to eat still. But um, certainly the Lord will uh, satisfy us in, in every single way. Even Jesus said on one occasion that His meat and His drink was to do the will of His Father. And so as He is doing that, the Lord is ministering to Him in a way that is so satisfying, more satisfying than anything the world has to offer. So think about that next time you feel dis dissatisfied. So any last questions or comments? As we uh, spend time in prayer this evening, we should remember uh, what we've looked at this week as well as what we looked at last time, which is the Spirit of God helps us in our prayers. But again, as we pray, we should ask that God would satisfy the desires of our souls and fill us up with the Spirit of God so that we are content. Well, let's, uh, let's close with a word of prayer, and then we'll go ahead and assemble in the back.